Okay. So, uh, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, Professor Julia Stoyanovic from New York University. Uh, Julia has several roles at uh, New York University. Uh, first of all, she is an associate, an institute associate professor of computer science and engineering in the Tandem School of Engineering. Then she is an associate professor uh, of data science at the Center of uh, Data Science. And finally, she's a director of the Center of Responsible AI at New York uh, University. Uh, as this title suggests, uh, she works on data management with emphasis on responsible data science, uh, where her work covers all aspects of uh, data science, uh, including uh, fairness, diversity, explainability, and transparency and data protection. Uh, in addition to her uh, scholarly work and publications and research, Julia has been playing an increasing role as a public intellectual in the best sense of the, uh, of the word. And she's trying to bring the issues of uh, responsible data science to the broader public. Uh, among her activities include uh, her co-authorship of a comic book on data responsibly that uh, uh, you can find on the web. And she also writes uh, fairly regularly, I would say, editorials uh, about issues of uh, responsible data science. So today she will be talking to us about comparing apples and oranges, fairness and diversity in ranking. And Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Fukion, for the kind intro and for having me. Let me share my screen. All right. Uh, and make sure that I can still see you all. Okay, good. So um, I will be speaking indeed about comparing apples and oranges. And by that, I mean comparing uh, and trying to make fair and diverse and useful various types of rankings that we may derive. Um, so to start, let us consider a data set of individuals being ranked and shown here in rank order as a permutation with item B ranked first, followed by C, et cetera. And suppose that our goal is to select K equals four best qualified candidates for an in-person interview for an internship. We may return the selected candidates in rank order or as a set. And in the latter case, we are performing what's known as set selection. And that is a special case of ranking. Consider the result and note that uh, no black candidates and only one female candidate is returned among the top four. So why is this the case is the question. And the obvious answer is that their scores are insufficiently high to be ranked among the top four. But why is that the case? Why aren't any minority and female candidates scoring highly enough? And here we must take a critical step we must explicitly state our beliefs about the societal nature of this technical problem. And I'm stating my beliefs here that are consistent with the goals of equity. First, I state that scores do not appropriately reflect applicants' current qualifications. I state that due to inadequate access to resources, black race and female gender present systematic obstacles. And further, I may assert that X1 a score on a standard mathematics exam, for example, is problematic for both groups, putting candidates who are both black and female at a double disadvantage and potentially leading to intersectional discrimination. In my example, this disadvantage is entangled in a single scoring attribute X1. Further, I assert that current qualifications should not fully determine access to developmental opportunity and future ability to compete. And why am I saying this? Well, note that this point of competition is for access to an internship, not a full-time position. So clearly this is a developmental opportunity. And the challenge now conceptually and technically is what assumptions do we make about the nature of the disadvantage? How do we model it? And how do we go about counteracting its effects? The focus of our conversation today is on these challenges. My interest in what we're now calling responsible data science started in about 2011 
that was the year that I subscribed to the New Yorker. And that's when I read an article by Malcolm Gladwell, from which I'm citing here, a quoting here about the importance of rankings. In this article, Gladwell starts by explaining just how arbitrary a ranking can be and how influential, stating with an ex example of rankings of sports cars, where you can easily get every permutation by suitably changing the scoring formula. And then he immediately dives into the high stakes game of college rankings. Gladwell speaks about how values and beliefs can be silently legitimized by technical choices and about the power that numbers, data, and technology hold in society, setting societal standards, hiding between proxies, and comparing apples and oranges with far-reaching impacts. I would like to start our conversation today by setting the stage, discussing two types of algorithmic rankers, the fairness goals that we may want to pursue, and what bias mitigation objectives may correspond to these goals. I'll speak about the meaning that I assign to this term bias. I will then describe several recent methods for making score-based rankers fair. These methods are divided into three unequal categories, and these are intervening on the ranked outcome, on the score distribution, or on the ranking function. I will close with some thoughts on the general direction of this work of comparing apples and oranges and more apples yet. So let us make our running example a bit more concrete. Consider a college admissions officer who is selecting candidates from a large applicant pool. Each applicant is associated with several demographic or socioeconomic attributes called the sensitive attributes here. And in my example, these attributes are gender and race. An applicant submits several qualification attributes. These include quantitative scores, all transformed here to a discrete scale of one, which is worst, through five, which is best. X is the high school GPA in my example, grade point average. X, X1, sorry, X2 is the verbal portion of the SAT. And X3 is the math portion of the SAT. Attribute X4 is a weighted feature vector that is extracted from an applicant's essay with higher values of the weights corresponding to stronger interest in a specific major. The admissions officer uses a suite of tools to sift through the applications and identify promising candidates. Many of these tools are indeed rankers. A ranker takes a data set of candidates described by structured features, text, or both as input, and it produces a permutation of the candidates, also called a ranking. The admissions officer will take the order in which the candidates appear in a ranking under advisement when deciding whom to consider more closely, interview, and admit. These tools include score-based rankers that compute the score of each candidate based on a formula that the admissions officer gives, and then return some number of highest scoring applicants in ranked order. The scoring formula may, for example, specify the score as a linear combination of the applicant's high school GPA and their two components of SAT, each carrying an equal weight. And this is how Y1 is computed. Ranking tau one gives candidates in sorted order on that score, one, one, Y1. Predictive analytics are also among the admissions officer's toolkit. For example, multiple ranking models may be trained, one per undergraduate major or set of majors, on features X1 through X4 of the successful applicants from past years to predict applicants standing upon graduation, based, for example, on their GPA in the major. These ranking models are then used to predict the ranking of this year's applicants. In my example, score feature Y2 predicts performance in a STEM major, and it leads to ranking tau2, while feature Y3 predicts performance in a humanities major, such as literature or fine art, and it leads to ranking tau3. So to recap, a ranker takes a data set of candidates described by structured features, text or both as input, and it produces a permutation of these candidates, also called a ranking. 
A decision maker, like an admissions officer, may then consider the candidates in rank order, or they may consider the top K candidates as a set. In our example, a ranker is a decision support tool. It helps an admissions officer select candidates based on the policies adopted by the college and admit students who are likely to succeed, complete the program with high marks and graduate on time. This can be seen as a utility goal and who would form a diverse group in terms of their demographics, both overall and in each major. And when making their decisions, the admissions officer may realize that students' scores should be taken with a grain of salt because they may be biased. This corresponds to a fairness goal. And we will now take a couple of minutes to discuss bias. In their seminal 1996 paper, Helen Nissenbaum and Bartley Friedman discussed <coughs> bias in computer systems and categorized it along three dimensions, represented here as a three-headed dragon, pre-existing, technical, and emergent. Pre-existing is the type of bias that is independent of the technical system and has its origins in society. For example, uh, pre-existing bias in ranking, uh, bless you, you may want to mute. Uh, we may consider the SAT test. College applicants in the US are commonly ranked on their SAT score, often in combination with other features. And it has been documented that the mean score of the math section of the SAT differs across racial groups, as does the shape of the score distribution. Uh, and this disparity then is often going to be attributed to racial and class inequalities encountered early in life and presenting persistent obstacles to upward mobility and opportunity. Technical bias is the type of bias that can arise from technical constraints or considerations, such as the screen size or a ranking's inherent position bias, the geometric drop in visibility for items at lower ranks compared to those at higher ranks. Position bias arises because in Western cultures, we read from top to bottom and from left to right. And so items appearing in the top left corner of the screen attract more attention. A practical implication of position bias and rankings that do not admit ties is that even if two items are equally suitable for a searcher, only one of them can be placed above the other, suggesting to the searcher that it's better and should be prioritized. Note that as all rankings carry an inherent position bias, any method that produces rankings with equalized candidate visibility implicitly addresses this technical bias. Emergent bias is the type of bias that arises in the context of use of a technical system. In ranking and recommendation, it arises most notably because searchers tend to trust the system to indeed show them the most suitable items at the top positions, which in turn shapes a searcher's idea of what a satisfactory answer for their search is. These feedback loops can create a winner-takes-it-all situation in which consumers increasingly prefer one majority product over everything else. In college admissions, if a system is persistently placing students from the same demographic group at the top of the ranking, then this will likely shape the admissions officer's understanding of what a good candidate looks like. Today, we will speak primarily about pre-existing bias. To understand it, I like to use the following metaphor. I like to think of data as a mirror image of the world and of pre-existing bias as distortions, emissions, amplifications, or shifts in this image. A data set won't know whether it's distorted. It's up to a human to make that assertion and to intervene on the distortions accordingly. A data set may be biased even if it represents the world faithfully, however. This may be the case if the world represented by that data set is not how it should or could be. For example, a data set may signal that college applicants from families with ample access to resources and tutoring are better prepared than their peers from less affluent backgrounds. But this does not mean that less affluent kids should be denied developmental opportunities. This brings us immediately to the next point, which is if a data set is assumed to suffer from pre-existing bias, then how might we go about mitigating this bias? 
On this point, political philosophy can give us useful guidance. One particular notion we would like to look at is equality of opportunity. I will call it EOP. EOP is a broad concept, but all views have this in common. An EOP respecting society eliminates barriers to achievement that are irrelevant and arbitrary. That means that personal characteristics that simply don't matter in a given context, like baking skills or beauty or race or class in most employment contexts, don't improve your access to desirable positions in that context. And conversely, these characteristics don't hurt anyone's access to positions either. Fala Arif Khan, Eleni Manis, and I co-authored the comic book volume, which is one of several volumes that, that we've co-authored, and it's shown here. And it was also presented uh, at a tutorial at last year's ACM FACT conference on the links between EOP and algorithmic fairness. Here, I will very quickly recap two notions from that much broader topic that will be relevant for us today. And conversely, uh, the, the first is the distinction between formal and substantive EOP. Formal EOP, shown on the left here, states that a competition is fair when competitors are only evaluated on the basis of their relevant qualifications. In any contest, the most qualified person wins. This view rejects any qualifications that are irrelevant for the job, for example, hereditary privileges or social status like being an aristocrat, won't get you the job. However, formal EOP makes no attempt to correct for arbitrary privileges and disadvantages that can lead to disparities between people's qualifications. For example, because of the way that society has been set up, being a woman might preclude you from getting certain opportunities to build qualifications. The resulting disparities in your qualifications compared to male candidates is not something that the formal view seeks to correct for. Instead, it emphasizes that the decision to give you the job will not explicitly be based on your gender. In contrast, substantive EOP aims to provide people genuine opportunity to build better qualifications so that at the point of competition, they have a fair chance at success. And here we will discuss the lack egalitarian version of substantive EOP on which the technical components of my talk to which I'm about to get are going to be based. The lucky egalitarian says that our outcomes should only be affected by our choice luck or responsible choices. No effects of brute luck, for example, from having rich parents or getting struck by lightning should be allowed to stand. They gather around a communal fire, forsaking all disparities in talent and effort in favor of unicorns on rainbows. So of course, this is a utopian view. Our mascots here are Dworkin and Romer and their majestic unicorn muses. The motto of the lucky egalitarian is nothing that you did not choose for yourself should affect your life prospects. This seems extremely attractive, but the hard question is how can we separate the effects of luck from the effects of responsible choices? Romer gives us a version of EOP that can in fact be operationalized. He says, instead of trying to split a candidate's qualifications into effects of brute luck versus choice luck, we can identify certain matters of brute luck, such as race, gender, disability, etc., that we know impact a person's access to opportunity to develop qualifications. We can then make a fair hiring or college admissions decision by ranking candidates in their effort circumstance distribution, comparing people with others of the same circumstances. Romer compares people only to others in similar circumstance, controlling for irrelevant circumstance. Apples are compared to apples, oranges to oranges, and bananas are ranked relative to bananas. So having briefly discussed bias and equality of opportunity, let me now return to algorithmic rankers and show how we might implement bias mitigation. And here I will in fact focus on score-based rankers. Uh, in these rankers, we are going to be intervening on one of several points of a decision. Uh, we will discuss three families of bias mitigation strategies for these rankers. We will start with intervening on the ranked outcome on the right of the diagram. 
We will then discuss intervening on scores, that's on the left. And finally, I will highlight very briefly a method that intervenes on the ranking function in the middle, if time permits, and probably it won't. So my focus today is here. So let's jump right into our first set of interventions. And for this, consider a ranking in which candidates are assigned to one of two groups according to a single binary sensitive attributes, such as binary gender, majority or minority ethnicity, or disability status. Suppose that one of these groups corresponds to the protected group, a group that has been historically disadvantaged. I'm showing here three examples of such rankings, tau one, two, and three. With protected groups, uh, group candidates colored in red, uh, privileged group in blue, and both groups appearing in equal proportion. How might we check whether a ranking is fair and how can we quantify the degree of unfairness of a ranking? Here, I will take a simple interpretation of fairness. We want to check whether a candidate's visibility in a ranking depends on their sensitive attribute. Knowing if they are red and blue, red or blue, what would that tell me about their visibility? In 2017, Kay Yang and I proposed the first formalization of fairness in ranking based on the following simple intuition. Because it's more beneficial for an item to be ranked higher, it is also more important to achieve proportional representation at higher ranks. The idea then is to take several well-known proportional representation measures and to make them rank aware by placing them within a framework that applies position-based discounts. What are these discounts? The idea is simple. I'm giving a formula that computes the utility of the top K over ranking as the sum of scores of the top K candidates. Say K equals four, this value is 30 for tau one at the top four. And I'm showing a position discounted version here, dividing every score by the log base two of rank plus one before adding it to the total. According to this metric, the utility of the top four of tau one is about 20. Position-based discounting is commonly used to quantify utility or prediction accuracy in a ranking. In a similar vein, the use of position-based discounting is a natural way to make setwise proportional representation requirements rank aware. Specifically, the idea is to consider a series of prefixes of a ranking, uh, tau for k equals 10, 20, etc., and treat each top k prefix as a set to compute statistical parity at top k and to compare that value to the proportion of the protected group in the entire ranking. And naturally perfect statistical parity will be achieved when k equals n. The values computed at each cutoff point are then summed up for a position-based discount. Based on this idea, we propose three measures that I will not discuss in detail here. Um, these measures are called uh, normalized discounted difference ratio and KL divergence. And I'm showing the normalized discounted ratio here. At each prefix of a ranking, we compute the proportion of members of the red group and the blue group among the top K, subtract that from their relative proportion in the overall data set, sum up these values with the logarithmic discount. And uh, essentially, I'm going to skip these details here. Um, the point here is that this is an early work on fairness in ranking. Uh, it works for a single sensitive attribute and performance was only shown on binary attributes. The approach is designed around a relative view of effort. Candidates are ranked according to score within a demographic group. And the ranked outcome is considered fair if the groups are mixed in equal proportion when the input is balanced or more generally when statistical parity is achieved at high ranks. This links to the luck egalitarian EOP notion that I discussed briefly. Uh, and so I'm giving it a unicorn before moving on. So let us move forward uh, in time and consider a different setup that is slightly more complex and more realistic perhaps. Consider the task of selecting four candidates among 16 job applicants. Our goals here are twofold. The first is diversity. We wish to include two candidates of each gender and at least one of each race. The second goal is utility, maximizing the sum of scores of the selected candidates subject to diversity constraints. 
This problem was proposed in 2018 by Sellis and co-authors, and they called it the constrained ranking maximization problem and studied it formally. We see an instance of this problem here. In the example shown, diversity constraints are satisfiable. However, as was shown by Sellis, the constrained ranking maximization problem can be seen to generalize various amplified problems, such as independent set, hypergraph matching, and set packing, and so is hard in the general case. It turns out that even checking if there is a feasible ranking is anti-hard. The authors show that a special case of this problem in which each candidate is assigned to at most one group, and so the assignment induces a partitioning on the set of candidates, can be solved in polynomial time. In this case, diversity constraints can only be specified with respect to a single sensitive attribute, gender or race. The authors also investigate approximability under different assumptions about the sensitive attributes, the diversity constraints, and the properties of the utility metric. Note that this example is deliberately constructed to highlight disparities in scores due to pre-existing bias on gender and on race. All male candidates are ranked above all female candidates of a given race. And all whites are ranked above all blacks who are in turn ranked above all Asians. For this reason, imposing diversity constraints leads to a substantial drop in score-based utility. The unconstrained set of candidates would include A, B, C, and D with a total score of 68. This set meets the diversity constraints. The set that meets the diversity constraints, sorry, is A, B, G, and K with a total score of 53. If we consider the selected set more closely though, the one that meets the diversity requirements, we observe a problem. And that is that we picked the best according to score white and male candidates, A and B, but we did not pick the best black, Asian, or female candidates. And in this example, what I'm highlighting is that if some population groups have systematically lower scores, then it costs less to skip their best scoring candidates in the name of diversity. This runs contrary to the nature of the diversity objective itself, which is to equalize access to opportunity. And this also presents unfairness under, again, a particular belief system. Suppose that scores represent effort, for example, how hard someone studied on a test. We may take a relative view of effort and assert that scores are more informative within a group than across groups. Further, we may assert that it is important to reward effort. Taken together, this is once again the lack egalitarian conception of equality of opportunity. And having stated our beliefs, there is, of course, something we can do. Consider the set of four candidates with purple marks next to them, A, C, E, and F. Like the pink set, this set also meets the diversity constraints, and it contains the top scoring candidates of both genders and the top white and black candidates. And so it's much better in terms of rewarding effort across groups than was the pink set. Having stated our beliefs, and observe the trade-off between diversity, utility, and fairness, we are now ready to design an intervention. For example, we may compute unfairness for a group like the female candidates as the ratio of the score of the lowest scoring selected candidate, that is G with score 10, and the score of the highest scoring skipped candidate, C with score 16. We call this measure IGF ratio, where IGF stands for in-group fairness. IGF ratio is one for the male group, since the lowest scoring selected candidate has a higher score than the highest scoring skipped one. We compute IGF ratio analogously for the white, black, and Asian groups. IGF ratio is, of course, not the only possible measure. We propose another one in the paper that's called IGF AG aggregate and that I don't have time to discuss today. So here I'm showing IGF ratio for female that is below one and IGF ratio for the male group that equals one. Um, 
And here I'm computing also the values for Asian and for Black. Now, armed with these measures, we can design an intervention. We devised an integer linear program that simultaneously encodes diversity constraints and balances utility loss across groups. And we ran some experiments on synthetic and real data, showing that, in fact, the utility cost of balancing fairness in most cases is low. And I'm showing here some of these results uh, on the medical expenditures panel survey data set, showing that the distance in IGF loss indeed is reduced after our intervention. On the right, the lines are closer together and are closer to one, even for smaller groups, compared to the situation before these constraints were uh, enforced. So I could pause now, or I could, uh, in the interest of time, zip through uh, whatever I'm able to cover, and then we can take questions at the end. What do folks prefer? I don't see any questions at this point, but if people have questions, by all means, maybe you can. I have a couple of questions. I'll save them for the end, so. OK. And how much time do I have? Another 10 minutes or so, right? Uh, another seven minutes. Seven, OK. So I'm going to go very fast here. Uh, the next topic is intervening on the score distribution. Uh, and here we are going to uh, having considered several methods that intervened on the ranked outcome directly with the help of representation and diversity constraints. Now we will discuss a method that while still intervening on the outcomes with respect to a given data set of candidates, take a step towards analyzing the score distribution of the candidates. Consider the task again of hiring a job applicant, but now I'm changing the setup a little bit. My goal here is gonna to be to hire a candidate with a high score, and you have to do this in an online or a streaming setting. Candidates arrive one by one, their score is revealed as they are interviewed, and you have to decide on the spot whether to hire them before interviewing the next candidate. So here I'm interviewing people, I'm revealing their scores, higher scores are better. Uh, and you may assume that the number of candidates is known, it's six in my example, and that they are arriving in an order that does not depend on their score. So this of course is the famous secretary problem stated more formally as, uh, as follows. The goal is to pick one element of a randomly ordered sequence to maximize the probability of picking the maximum element of the sequence. The provably optimal strategy is as follows. We consider and reject the first S, in this case, that's two, and that is computed as N divided by the number E and the floor of that candidates. Uh, we record T, the best seen score, among the first S candidates. In our example, that, is, that score is four. And this is known as the warm-up phase. And we use it to get a sense of what good candidates look like. We accept the next candidate with a score that is better than T. And in my example here, the warm-up phase ended at candidate one, and we accepted the candidate with score five. We now continue with the online setting and consider a different question somewhat. How might we go about selecting three candidates with at least one of each gender, male or female? These are gonna be uh, shown in blue or pink. And as before, the goal is to maximize the total score of selected candidates subject to diversity constraint on gender. Like in the classic case we just discussed, we attack such problems by devising a strategy to first estimate the scores of the candidates during a warm-up phase, and to then hire candidates whose scores are good enough. In my example, I will interview a bunch of candidates first, and will decide that the blue seven looks good, while the pink three does not. And then I will hire the blue eight and seven, but will forego the pink four, and at the end, I will be forced to hire the last remaining pink candidate with a score of one, foregoing the higher scoring pink candidates. This, as you can see, has a similar flavor as the previous example that I showed. 
This is problematic under the lucky egalitarian equality of opportunity once again. Uh, and the problem is that in my strategy, I've taken an absolute view of effort rather than a relative view. I measured everybody against the same score threshold, no matter whether they are blue or pink candidates. So now, we, how might we go about addressing this issue, operationalizing our beliefs that this is wrong? Uh, we will devise a different strategy where we estimate scores separately per group. And then we will pick the pink three who will look good. Uh, the, sorry, then we will pick the pink four because it will look good uh, after the warm up where the threshold for the pink group was three. Uh, and we developed several methods that work in this vein in the paper that I'm citing here, and also ran a systematic study to show that per category warm up is crucial if we expect there to be differences in score distributions across groups. In our experiments, we showed specifically <coughs> uh, that if you expect A's, the blue group, to have lower scores than B's, then uh, per group warm up is crucial. It allows us to uh, hire the best among comparable candidates in each group. And in this last development, we saw how one might go about estimating score distributions separately per group and to use that information for set selection. Uh, in what follows, if I have a couple of minutes, uh, I will discuss a method that intervenes on the score distributions themselves to level the playing field. So for the final method in this segment, consider again a data set of candidates with specified gender and race, this data set is used by a moving company to hire K equals four best qualified candidates. Note that score attribute X represents a candidate's weightlifting ability and higher is better. Outcome Y depends, um, represents the candidate's final qualification score. Candidates are ranked in decreasing order of Y. And the process by which Y is derived is hidden from us, but we do observe each applicant's attributes, including their gender, race, and score. We may have reason to believe, based on our knowledge of discriminatory practices in hiring, that gender and possibly race impact the qualification score. And we state our beliefs here in the form uh, of a structural causal model, SCM. And SCM is a directed acyclic graph where vertices represent observed or latent variables and edges indicate causal relationships from source to target vertices. The arrows pointing from gender, G, and race are directly to Y, encode the effect of direct discrimination. We want to check whether such links exist in our data and if so, to break them. And these arrows are shown in pink. Additionally, the SCM can encode indirect discrimination. G and R both impact Y through weightlifting ability X. It's called the mediator variable. So the question is, should we or should we not allow gender and race to impact X? And we know from, from life that uh, women are on average able to lift weights less well than our men. So conceivably, there might be signal that we're passing through X from G, but we may assert that race should not impact uh, the outcome either directly or through X. And in our approach, we have the flexibility to state that if impact of race on X is determined to be in fact in effect in our data set, it should be disallowed. On the other hand, the impact of gender on weightlifting ability can be considered legitimate. The SCM on the right encodes these beliefs. In it, X is treated as a so-called resolving mediator for gender, but not for race, as denoted by the color of the corresponding arrows. Now, to go from our beliefs stated as a structural causal model to an intervention, we are going to compute scores for each individual in the data, treating each of them in the, sam in the same way as if they belonged to a particular intersectional group. For example, black women, the most disadvantaged group in our data, and then rank on those counterfactual scores. And I will not go into the details of how these uh, scores are computed, but I'm showing them schematically here 
with uh, this mascot who is a dark uh, skinned Brienne of Tars from Game of Thrones, uh, who represents this very strong black woman uh, whose score we are computing and assigning essentially to each data point. So I know that I need to wrap up. I don't unfortunately have time to go over another line of work in which we consider the geometric interpretation of rankers and intervene on the ranking model itself. Um, and maybe to close in just one moment, uh, I want to say that of course, fairness and diversity won't take us all the way to solving these complex societal problems. We need to also look outside of this box. Uh, and there's some work on transparency that I would be happy to discuss maybe at another uh, opportunity that we use nutritional labels for rankings to capture. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip this. Here's an example of an actual label. And maybe to just close very quickly. Um, there's a survey on fairness and ranking in which the methods that I discussed today briefly and others by us and others are uh, discussed. Please take a look at this archive link. And many thanks to my wonderful collaborators on all of this work. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this uh, fascinating talk on such a timely and important uh, topic. Um, let's see if we have questions from our audience. Uh, maybe they can, uh, I don't see anyone, any questions in the um, Google document, but uh, please unmute and ask the question. Okay, hearing none, let me ask a couple of questions if I may. Uh, first, a technical question and then a broader policy question. The technical question is, the work you presented assumes that the ranking is based on a single score, is that correct? Uh, it, it assumes that the ranking is based on a score. So I worked specifically with score-based rankers here. Score. Some of the yeah, some mm -hmm. of the work that I showed applies also to learned rankers. I didn't have time to go into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's important is that sometimes we know how that score is computed. Sometimes we have access to the actual attributes that, that make part of that score. What I had in mind is something that um, comes from the area of uh, multi-objective optimization, mm -hmm. where instead of trying to optimize one quantity, you have two or three or a fixed number of quantities. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you talk about, as you know, Pareto optimality and concepts like this. Uh, it seems to me very reasonable in ranking to have uh, more than one scores capturing different features as opposed to try to combine uh, to combine them into a single number it has this uh, is is this notion um, has this notion been used and if so are some of your methods applicable yeah that's a great question for you and so when when i uh, think about rankings uh, my thinking is never that a ranking is a priori the right way to present this data. And in fact, very often we find that rankings that people derive and that they use are actually not informative at all. For example, there are lots of ties in them, right? So a method that actually shows you uh, the set of uh, candidates that, that are Pareto optimal would be much, much better. Mm -hmm. However, in practice, what we find is that that's too complex for, for users. And so what we're faced with is working within the constraints of the decision-making environment that we are presented with. And unfortunately, that environment is total orders without ties even, right? So, so even ties are disallowed. So um, this absolutely is, you know, is, is a great and a relevant thought here. I think it would technically make more sense to think in terms of uh, Pareto optimality, but I just don't see how practices, for example, hiring practices or admissions practices would uh, be changed to accommodate these notions that just require a lot more from the user. Uh, I mean, perhaps one could show that if you use a multi-objective criteria, you will get more fairness if you can quantify that. I mean, that yeah, it might... depends. It, it depends on how you quantify it. Uh, but yeah, this is certainly something that, that I'd be happy to, to follow up on. Yeah. yeah. And the, and the broader policy question is, um, it's great that these um, somewhat vague ideas of uh, fairness and diversity and uh, can be can be formalized, made, quantified, and and uh, as you described, you can have interventions to uh, mitigate the, the issues. 
Uh, what about adoption? How do you how do you see the the adoption playing out? Is, do you think it's at the level at the corporate level at the legislative level at the broader societal level? How do we go from? I mean, I know you're very much engaged with this. I mean, what is your right. best uh, guess as to what might work? And uh, thank you for that question. So you noticed, of course, that I spent. Uh, about half of the time, maybe a little less than half of the time on setting the stage, right? Uh, and the rest on the technical solutions. And this is atypical uh, for a technical talk, but I think that this is actually crucial because without grounding uh, the, in the technical interventions, no matter, matter how simple or how complex in a relevant societal context, we are not going to get to adoption, right? Because then it's just gonna be a purely mechanical intervention and there isn't gonna be one that rules them all and it's gonna be my word against yours about which one is the right one to adopt. So for us to actually uh, be able to change these technical practices, we need to think about how they link to existing laws, to existing rules, regulations, to existing business practices. And this is something that, that really, uh, at the moment lacks, this link lacks. There aren't enough people thinking hard enough about this intermediate level of, of how to communicate the non-technical ideas to technologists, the technical ideas to the actual people who are gonna pass laws or decide what hiring software to buy in their company, right? So um, maybe I'm not answering your question directly, but uh, it's, it's a bit, you know, we need all hands on deck ultimately. There isn't going to be just a regulatory solution that's going to solve it. There won't be just an algorithmic notion of fairness that we all will buy. We know that, um, you know. So, so it, it, it's really just about understanding why am I uh, fudging with my data in the way that I'm uh, fudging with it. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Uh, I, I guess I can go for one. Thank you, Julia, for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so may, maybe you talked about this and maybe I missed this, but I wanted to ask, is it possible that we have maybe partial data on attributes like uh, race and gender that you talked about and still be able to achieve sort of better fairness in the outcome? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure how that would work, but maybe that sort of, uh, taking into account the distribution of the data and um, maybe having some randomization with the hope that at least we would have a um, diverse set in the output. So do you mean that we don't have access to information about people's membership in protected groups? And that exactly. we are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so th this, this is plausible. And in fact, in the United States, in many domains, we're not allowed to ask people what is their gender, race, disability status, et cetera. Uh, based on the doctrine of disparate treatment, uh, meaning you should not actually be taking this information into account when making decisions that impact individuals. And yet you are responsible under the doctrine of disparate Im impact for showing that at the group level, you don't discriminate based on gender and race, etc. And so various industries have their own ways to uh, interpolate uh, what are people's membership in protected groups so as to be able to report that they don't discriminate. So for example, banks are going to be interpolating um, what is the racial or the gender makeup, racial mostly, or socioeconomic makeup of their applicant pool for a particular mortgage based on some data from the census and from you know, some voluntarily submitted information. So yes, people do this, but the point is that for individual level decisions, you really cannot rely on such interpolated data. Uh, it, it's very complex. And this is one example where we can make assumptions like I've made, right? That you actually know what is people's gender, what is people's race, and then you develop interventions with that information, but that may or may not be available. Now, one of the things that um, folks have been advocating for, including me, is that this uh, the fact that we don't have individual level data on what is people's gender, race, and disability status is actually preventing us from enacting interventions in ways that are meaningful. So there needs to be more thoughtful data governance approaches here that would allow us to actually get that data and only use it for that particular purpose. And that would be to check that there's no discrimination and to enact affirmative action. Got it. So that's one step in the adoption. 
as we talked about. Surely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, Julia. We have to close this here. I really appreciate your availability and wonderful talk. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, Akil, you want to take over? Sure, yes. Okay. Thank you, Fokin. Uh, so let's move on to the next talk. Uh, it's the second and the last talk, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Bezad Golshin from Megagon Labs. Bezad obtained his PhD in computer science from Boston University, where he was part of the data management group. And he's now a senior research scientist at Megagon Labs in Mountain View, California. Over the years, uh, he has worked and published in several different areas of research, including but not limited to data management, data mining, and natural language processing. Uh, he was a wonderful collaborator and a mentor to me. In fact, uh, last year when I got a chance to work at Megagon Labs in the summer. Uh, today, he's going to talk about his work on Darwin, which is an adaptive rule discovery for labeling text data. So uh, if, if, if you have questions, we have the link to the Q&A doc in the chat. And also after the talk, uh, we'll have a few minutes for verbal Q&A session. So uh, from here, let's hear from uh, Bezab. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. Um, yes, we can. All right. And let me go to the presentation mode. And I hope that you can see um, the slides full screen. Yes. All right. So thank you, Akil, for the introduction. And thank you all for being here. I think it's an honor for me to be here and talk about some of the work uh, that we are doing at Megagon Labs. Um, so as Akil said, my name is Behzad and I am a research scientist at Megagon Labs. Um, today I'm going to talk about a system called Darwin that we have created so that we can actually um, get a lot of label text data uh, for a very small cost. And uh, this is joint work with uh, my colleague Sayam Galhotra uh, from University of Chicago and Wang Chu Tan from Facebook. Uh, but I have to mention that the work was done when all of us were at Megacon Labs. So University of Chicago and Wang Chu Tan from Facebook. Uh, but I have to mention that the work was done when all of us were at Megacon Labs. So um, I want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about Megacon Labs. So Megacon Labs is, a, uh, is the research arm of uh, Recruit Group, uh, which is a company in Japan, but they own uh, more than uh, 350 subsidiaries across the globe. Uh, many of them are in the US or in Europe and some are in uh, Japan as well. And uh, our research focus are in the broader areas of artificial intelligence, data management, and natural language processing. And uh, I also wanna mention that we are hiring uh, full-time researchers and software engineers. So if you know anybody who might be interested, uh, please direct them to us. Uh, and we are also looking for interns, mostly for uh, summer. Uh, but if you're a student or you have a student who might be interested in doing research over the summer, uh, please um, actually forward them to us. Um, all right, so uh, let's get this started. So I, I actually want to say that uh, I had this talk recorded, but then I realized that the recording is too robotic. So I decided to, again, uh, uh, speak directly here. Uh, but I apologize if I'm a little bit, uh, you know, distracted and, uh, um, yeah, uh, not up to it uh, completely. All right. So let's talk about trends in machine learning. Uh, so I assume uh, many of you have seen a graph like this one that I'm showing in the top left. And, um, of course, this is a fake graph, but uh, I think the message that it conveys uh, is that, you know, over and over, we have seen over the past uh, few years, that uh, with deep learning techniques, it seems like that we can keep uh, adding to our uh, essentially training data and you know, simultaneously scaling these models to improve the performance. And this was not really the case with sort of traditional machine learning algorithms, at least with most of them, as we can see that you know, by adding more training data at some point, the performance plateaus. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, um, because of that, actually, we see a great success for deep learning techniques. And in fact, uh, in the area that we mainly focus on natural language processing, we have seen 
significant improvements in various tasks. This includes uh, machine translation, information extraction, document classification, and you know, building chatbots and many more. Um, so uh, this has really um, created an exciting uh, sort of setting for people to work in. But the main problem that now we face is that these models that we create are data hungry. That is to say that we often need to collect a large uh, volume of training data to be able to achieve good results. And um, uh, this is actually what we're gonna ask in this talk. So how we can cheaply generate large amounts of training data so we can be able to actually build uh, these kind of large models. All right, so let's, let's answer that question. Uh, how can we create labeled data? Uh, so perhaps the most straightforward way or the, the way that we you know, classically learn is that we can just get a sample from our unlabeled corpus of data and then we can ask annotators to assign uh, labels to each example in that sample. So obviously this can be quite costly uh, and a slow. Um, and uh, this problem is even worse if you are uh, working with a data set that has a sort of imbalance underlying classes. Uh, because in that case, the annotators actually have to label many, many examples before we have you know, enough representative from an infrequent class uh, in the data. So uh, what else we can do? So the, the other thing that people have looked at is this sort of uh, this area of active learning. Um, and essentially um, the, what happens here is not very different from you know, just labeling the data manually. So you still have to do that. What is different is that you can only focus on examples that you think teach your model the most. So in that case, you are essentially just labeling uh, data points, or at least starting labeling from data points that the model is least confident about. And by doing that, you hope that you need a smaller set of examples because you're just um, selecting the most informative points for the model. But this still could be costly as, um, as you have to label instances manually, and you also have to repeat uh, the, the cycle of retraining your model and then evaluating the, the uh, sort of confidence of all the examples so that you would be able to do this. And that can be costly as well. So um, lastly, we have uh, essentially this su weak supervision paradigm, which is becoming more and more popular. Uh, and it is what we're going to focus on in this talk. So the idea here is that we can actually start uh, writing uh, some heuristics that can label different subset of the data for us. And um, the hope is that if these heuristics are better than random, and if we have many of them, which are potentially overlapping with each other in terms of the labels that they provide, um, then uh, we can actually learn a lot from these heuristics and, um, uh, and label essentially the data set uh, with minimal cost. But this um, approach has its own downsides as well. And this is what I'm going to uh, talk about next. Uh, but to motivate that, I think it would be good to talk about an example. So this is an example of a project that actually we have been working on. So uh, we, we were interested in uh, building uh, a question answering um, system uh, that uh, answers um, questions from guests in a hotel uh, from the persp perspective of the concierge. So essentially this uh, question answering system sits inst uh, instead of the concierge and answers questions like this one that you see. Uh, so if somebody asks, you know, what time does the pool open? Uh, we want the system uh, to respond what the concierge used to say. In this case, the indoor pool is open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., something like that. And uh, in this case, let's imagine that we are uh, trying to build an intent classifier. And as a starting point, I'm interested in intents uh, that are asking for a particular direction uh, from one location to another. So in this case, you know, it would be questions like, how can I get from the airport to the hotel? Or you know, what's the fastest way uh, to get to downtown uh, from here? Uh, and then you can also see examples of negative labels, questions that don't really have anything to, uh, to do with um, transportation. So let's focus on this uh, task and let's assume we wanna do um, some data labeling here. So we can start actually by getting some sample uh, from the corpus. Here, I'm actually showing five questions that we, we get from the, the corpus of chat logs. And if you look at these ones, you see that uh, you know, I, I highlight them, uh, highlighted them with red just to denote that none of them actually belongs to the intent class that we just described. 
So that's okay. So I guess we have to repeat this. So we get more samples and uh, you see that we, we get five more samples and still there's no trace of any positive instances. And you know, eventually if you repeat this, we might, uh, we might reach uh, an example of a sentence that says, you know, what's the best way to get uh, to the airport from the hotel? And sort of that's the first positive instance uh, that we find. So as you can see already, we have a problem here because in, in this particular case, actually the percentage of um, um, positive classes, the classes that, uh, sorry, positive instances, the instances that belong to our intent if, is less than 4%. So you have to do a lot of searching before you have a good number of these instances. Uh, but let's say you found this instance as we did, but now you have to talk about uh, writing a heuristic rule to describe um, essentially what you see in this instance. So maybe in this case, we decide that we wanna use something like a regular expression. And maybe it seems to us that the regular expression, like the one that I've uh, written in, um, at the bottom of the slide and the white box might be a reasonable one. So essentially this reads as, if you have the words best way, and then you could have um, a few words or none, and then this is followed by two, and then you need a number of words, and then this is followed by the keywords from. So maybe um, data points that actually match this regular expression uh, would be good candidates to label as positive. So fair enough, but you see that already in here, we also have a problem because at this point you can only uh, hire annotators or hire you know, people who are going to write rules for you who are familiar with this rule language. And this creates a problem because, you know, I mean, regular expressions are, I, I think they are still difficult, but you can imagine that you might have more sophisticated rule languages, things like rules on parse three of the, the sentences, and then they have to know what the parse three is and what are the tags that you have on the parse three. So this is also um, a big problem actually to address. Um, in a lot of scenarios. And then um, the last thing is that, you know, once we have this rule, um, uh, then how can we know that we have done a good job? So to be able to do that, actually, we have to write a program that says, okay, go and fetch every sentence in the corpus that matches this rule that I have uh, created. So essentially you also need an engine that would run this um, uh, uh, sort of rule for you and bring back the matching instances. So now if you look at the matching instances here, you will see that you have only found three, let's say, and then maybe out of those three, uh, two of them um, are not correct. So they, they follow the pattern, but they don't really belong to that intent class of asking for directions. Um, so in this case, you know, um, the annotator also has to make a judgment about the coverage of the rule that they have written and also its accuracy. So. Um, again, uh, this is just to show that this pro uh, the process of writing rules can be difficult because you have to go and do this also iteratively and, uh, and try to find the best rule that both has a good coverage and has a good accuracy and you know, gives you sort of diverse new examples compared to the past rules that you have written. Um, and this is not easy. I just want to clarify that that rule is not a bad rule. So actually it, it yields more than three examples and, and, and uh, accuracy is also not so bad, but you know, this is just for the sake of um, uh, talking about this example. All right, so um, now that we've talked about the challenges of you know, writing rules manually in these weak supervision paradigms, it's good to take a look at some of the existing tools that are out there uh, for doing this. So. In this case, I'm actually showing you a number of systems that uh, are in this domain and they actually deliver very, very good results. Uh, but uh, in this slide, I wanna categorize them based on um, sort of two properties uh, that we can think of uh, for these models. So the first one is you know, how much supervision uh, they require. And this is something that I'm showing on the X axis here. So, um, uh, you know, the more uh, supervision they need from annotators, the further right on the, uh, on the x-axis they would be. And then the other uh, property that I'm looking at is that how much initial um, labeled data they need to get us started. And that I'm showing actually on the, on the y-axis. So now that I've actually um, uh, told you what this graph sh is showing, it's good to talk about some of these systems. So I think at the, at the bottom right, the first system you see is a snorkel. So um, that's actually uh, one of the best tools that we have available in this space. Uh, but where this tool is focusing on is that once you have essentially your set of labeling rules, 
um, a snorkel guides you on what is the best way to use them. So at a, at a very high level, what the snorkel does is that it tells you how you can look at the overlap between these various rules that you have written. And using those, you can sort of estimate how much confidence you have in each rule and how much confidence you have in each label that is assigned to, an, uh, to a data point in your corpus. And uh, it also, the, the uh, snorkel also guides you on how you can use this sort of probabilistic labels to, to drive the best models possible. Uh, but the snorkel um, doesn't really do much in terms of, you know, helping you to discover rules. It, it provides, you know, some easy to use user interfaces that you can write your rules in and run them and evaluate the results. Uh, but essentially you are still in charge of coming up with the rules and, um, uh, and um, you know, uh, tuning them for your particular uh, intent or application that you have at hand. The other system that you see next to Snorkel is called Babel Level. So this is a very interesting system. And uh, the idea here was that we can uh, uh, show um, uh, actually sentences that are going to be labeled to people. And once they provide the label, we can ask them, why did you label it that way? Uh, so for example, in this case, people might say, uh, you know, because there was this word of going from to somewhere, then I'm going to label an instance as positive. And what Babel Labels try to do is to uh, parse the explanation that people give into a rule. Uh, so in this case, uh, this works uh, interestingly well. Um, but what is limited here is that Babel Level has a fixed rule language. So essentially, it, uh, it can understand what people usually say as explanations for these kind of tasks, like because of this word, I'm labeling it as a positive or because uh, you know, this phrase was followed by that phrase, I'm going to label it as positive. So it can only understand you know, sort of logic at that level and parses that into a specific rule language. Um, and then um, for these systems, as you can see, you know, with Babel level, you need less supervision because you don't have to sit and um, you know, manually uh, learn uh, uh, or come up with the rules and you don't have to um, essentially iterate to fine tune those rules. So you just provide an explanation of why uh, you did a particular labeling. With a snorkel, actually you need more supervision because you have to do that iterative process of writing rules. And then the last system here uh, that we have is uh, Snuba. Um, and um, the Snuba works in an interesting way. It actually says I can automatically come up with the rules, but to be able to do that, I need you to give me some labels data. So it essentially starts with a subset of um, uh, your corpus uh, that is labeled and automatically tries to find patterns that it thinks are yielding positive instances. So because of that, it actually doesn't require any supervision. Um, uh, uh, but it needs actually some label data set uh, to start with. Um, all right, so, and here comes actually our system, Darwin. So what Darwin does is that it actually sits somewhere between these two extremes of uh, tools that we see. So essentially, um, instead of annotators having to write rules, Darwin automatically uh, suggests rules uh, that can be good heuristic rules for labeling uh, the data. And um, that rule is just presented to annotators for verifying. Uh, and because of that, you know, verifying them is a much, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, easier supervision or much less supervision compared to writing explanations or writing the rules themselves, because you can just do a thumbs up, thumbs down on whether you like the rule or not. And then um, also in terms of data requirements, it only needs to start with you know, a couple of positive instances or one initial labeling rule. And then using that, uh, the system can get us started and it can help you label your, uh, label your corpus. So uh, before I dive into the details of how Darwin works, uh, I wanna show you the interface uh, for Darwin. So in this case, um, you can see, um, the interface that annotators see. And on the top left of um, uh, that box, you can see the intent that we are doing the labeling for. And you can see an example rule uh, that we have. And then on the right uh, side of it, we are asking the annotator whether they think this is a useful rule uh, or not. And at the bottom, we are showing some examples that match uh, the rule we have uh, created or that the, the rule that Darwin is suggesting. Um, 
So uh, the good thing about showing sample sentences is that in practice, you actually don't need allocators who can even understand the rule language. So they can just look at the examples and say, you know, based on the examples, do they feel like if it's an accurate rule or not? And uh, we, we can have essentially some control, some control over how confident we are with each rule by, you know, changing the number of examples that we are showing to, to each annotator and asking this question from them. All right, so now let's look at how uh, Darwin works. So um, essentially as the input to Darwin, we have the unlabeled input corpus. And as we talked about, we have an initial labeling rule, or it could be a, a few examples of positive instances. Um, and by few, I mean as, as a small as two or three. And then the output of the system, which you see on the right is going to be the labeled uh, corpus, along with the set of rules that we have used for doing that labeling. All right. And then as you can see, there are different components um, within Darwin that are sitting in between. Um, and um, the first step actually uh, is index generation. This is uh, actually one of the most complex part of Darwin and, and I'm going to talk about it at the high level, but then we can, we can dive deeper if we have time. Um, but essentially what we want to do here is that we want to build an index that can quickly tell us which rules match which sentences. Uh, and that's sort of we do in, in a uh, pre-processing step. Once we do that, then we can uh, we get to the main uh, cycle of Darwin, which essentially follows these steps. In the beginning, we select a set of candidate rules that we think are might be uh, useful to or might be helpful to be evaluated in this stage. Then we organize those rules uh, into a hierarchy um, that tells us about how these rules relate to each other. And uh, using that hierarchy and by traversing that hierarchy, we actually find the best uh, rule to present to the annotator. So the annotator actually sees the rule. If they verify it, it goes into the output set of positive rules that we have found. Um, and once that is done, uh, the feedback from the annotator is passed back to our system to update the scores uh, that we have internally. So these would be the scores of candidate rules and what we know about the instances. And I'm going to talk about these components in, in, in more detail. Uh, all right. Uh, so let's just start with index generation or index construction. Um, and the first thing that we have to talk about is um, how are we writing the rules? So as I talked about here, we are trying to build an index that can tell us which rules, um, uh, which instances matches which rules. Um, and um, if we wanna be able to do that, then we have to understand what kind of rules are, um, um, are ones that we are interested in. So to be able to do that, actually, we, we want as part of the input to, uh, to Darwin, um, the, the, the grammar of the rule language that we have. So, uh, to clarify that, so if you remember context-free grammars, that's what we use. And essentially here I'm showing the context-free grammar for a simplified version of a regular expression. So essentially this uh, context-free grammars tells you that you, know, you can have any sequence of words uh, and then you can have uh, either plus or a star between them, which means that you are, uh, you know, by plus means that there, there can be one or more words there and a star means that it could be zero or more words uh, in between. So, and what you see on the right are two examples of rules that you can drive from this grammar. So essentially it is uh, necessary for uh, Darwin to be able to take that uh, grammar as input and use that uh, to, to actually um, um, identify the space of possible rules. All right, so once we have the, um, the, uh, the rule grammar, we actually use it to enumerate uh, the possible, possible, the set of possible rules that match every sentence in our corpus. So in this case, you see two positive sentences that we have. Um, so the first one is what is the best way to get to San Francisco airport? And the other one is the over fastest way to get to the airport. So these two questions that we have and um, what we do here is that using the, uh, the grammar rule that we have, we find all the derivations of rules that actually match these instances and we organize them in these trees that you can see. So for instance, um, on the left, you can see starting from 
um, you know, the root, um, the first word that we can do a derivation over can be the word best. And that is something that matches these sentences because we already know about the vocabulary of these sentences. So once we have these trees, uh, then the next thing that we do is that we simply merge them. And uh, this index keeps track of what is the rule that we have and sort of what sentences matches uh, that rule. So as I mentioned, I have omitted uh, uh, some details actually from how this process is exactly done uh, just to keep the, the, uh, the talk flowing at a high level. But I uh, um, so suggest you to take a look at the paper if you're interested uh, in more details of this process. But I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, implementation details that we have to have here to be able to make this work. So obviously, the space of all possible rules that match even one instance can be huge. So what we do is that we focus on rules that can be derived with a few derivation steps. Um, and uh, that's essentially how we reduce the space of possible rules. Um, all right, so let's move on uh, to, the, to the other parts, which might be more interesting than building the index for doing these computations fast. So, um, once we have the index, then we go to the process of candidate selection. And essentially, in this case, we want to find rules that have a good overlap with the set of positive instances we have in each stage of the, this iterative process. So the intuition here is that if we find a rule that has some overlap with the positive set of examples that we have, then there is a chance that that rule would also you know, yield more positive instances for us. So essentially that's what we do. So we go for uh, overlap with the current positive set using the index that we have, but we also take uh, some diversity measures into account to make sure that we have different set of rules. So um, one would be, uh, we want to actually select different uh, subset of rules that give us coverage over different parts of our positive set. So we want some diversity in terms of the instances they cover. Uh, the, the other thing that we want is sort of diversity in terms of derivation rules that are used. So essentially we, we want to diversify what keywords are appearing in these rules. And then uh, the last thing is sort of the number of derivations required to get that rule. So essentially a, a rule that ha needs fewer derivations is a simpler rule, but one that you know, needs 10 uh, steps of derivations uh, then that's a much more complicated tool. So essentially we are selecting, uh, we are adding some diversity in terms of the complexity of the rules that we select. So once we have the, uh, the candidates generated, then um, the next step is to organize them in a hierarchy to do the hierarchy traversal algorithm. So what we do here is not, some, uh, is not anything complicated. So we essentially just organize the rule uh, based on their sort of parent child relationship. Um, that we have. So in this case, you know, um, any sentence that mentions the keyword best, um, uh, so sorry, if, if they mention the, the, the phrase best way, then for sure they also mention the keyword best. So you can, you can imagine that the set of sentences that match the keyword best are going to be a super set of um, uh, the keyword or the phrase best way. And then they also a super set of our um, regular expression that we see at the bottom with the star and the plus. So essentially we organize them into this parent-child hierarchy and then that's uh, what we're going to use uh, for hierarchy traversal. So once we have this set of smaller candidates and the uh, connections between them, um, we want to find what would be a good um, rule to show to the annotator. And here we, we had two observations that are helpful in terms of actually finding those rules. The first one is that, you know, if, if a rule uh, is not generating many positives, or in fact, if it's giving you back many negative instances, then it doesn't make sense to generalize that rule. So in this case, for instance, if we evaluate best way, uh, then maybe we see many negative instances. So if we see that, it doesn't make sense to now suggest best as a rule, because it's, it's just gonna be a superset of that. So it's still gonna contain too many negatives. Um, but uh, you know, specializing that might help because the, the regular expression that at the bottom, it might actually sort of find the better cut and find the positive instances. And then the second intuition that we have is that you know, it's, it's true that we have these rules and connections between them. But one thing we can do is to create a classifier 
um, using the positive instances that we have so far and you know, getting some, uh, doing some negative sampling to get some negative instances as well, but train a classifier and then see what is our estimate for uh, uh, essentially the, the confidence in other rules, which may not be directly related to the current rule that we have. So um, uh, we can talk about essentially these in more uh, details. So um, the, based on these two intuitions, we create um, uh, three uh, travel cell techniques. One we call local travel cell, which essentially only uses the first intuition of you know, when we should generalize and when we should specialize. Then we have the universal travel cell, which only focuses on this idea of retraining the, the classifier and then finding the next best rule according to the classifier. And then we have the hybrid uh, travel cell technique, which combines the two and as we show actually has the best performance. Um, so I wanted to also say that, you know, this uh, classifier that we train enables us to define this notion of a benefit of a rule or expected benefit of a rule. So what do we mean by that is that, let's say I'm considering a rule uh, that I call here with the letter R. And um, one thing I can take a look at is that if I run this rule, which presumably has a lot of overlap with my current positive set, but I can see that maybe there are 400 new instances, unlabeled instances that match this rule. So essentially, um, this is what I show with the function new of R. And that shows that you know, there could be 400 uh, new things to be labeled with this. And uh, then I'm using my classifier to get an estimate of what is my average confidence for these instances being positive. So let's say if the, our average confidence or the average probability of instances being positive according to the classifier is 0.75, then you can guess that in expectation we might have something like 300 positive instances coming, um, uh, actually being added to our set by using this rule. So essentially we use this notion of benefit for rule selection. All right, so now let's take a closer look at these uh, traversal techniques. So um, the, this is the algorithm for local traversal. Uh, it's not something very tricky. So essentially what we do is that we start with our seed rule. Uh, then we look at these generalizations. So that will be anything that is a parent node to this rule in the hierarchy. We evaluate them based on the benefit. Uh, and then you know, we take the best one. So that one is sort of presented to the annotator. So if the annotator um, responds with a negative, or we see that the benefit values are to too low for all the patterns that we have. In these cases, we actually uh, stop generalizing and instead we go and look at the uh, children of uh, that rule. So that would be more specializations of that rule. And um, we again look at the benefit of scores to pick the best one. And we keep repeating this process. Um, and here you can see an example of how this works in practice for our running example, which was finding intents about going from location A to B. And here you can see we can start with uh, a rule like best way to get to. Um, and then the model uh, decides that, you know, we need to generalize this rule, this seed rule. So it gets to way to get to, and then it generalizes further uh, and it gets to to get, which I assume is gonna create too many um, negative instances. So it's not a really good rule for finding the positive instances. So then it just starts specializing it. And then it keeps doing that uh, sort of specialization and generalization till you get to a rule like shuttle two, which is actually a very good rule, at least in our underlying data for finding if people are talking about, are asking about transportation from one location to another. So that's essentially how uh, local traversal works. And then we have uh, the universal hierarchy traversal. This is even simpler in terms of how it works. So essentially we train a classifier. We look at every rule that we have in, in the hierarchy and we evaluate their expected benefit. And then we go with the rule that has the highest benefits. Whether this is related to the currency rule or not, we don't care. Uh, so this is just jumping around essentially the hierarchy. And um, you know, once we get a feedback from the user, we repeat this process. And then um, lastly, we have the hybrid. And then the hybrid does something uh, simple in terms of switching back and forth between these two traversal algorithms. So essentially, sometimes we see that we get stuck in the local traversal. We cannot really find good generalization or specialization of a particular rule. When that happens, we want to switch to the universal um, 
uh, traversal algorithm. And sometimes with the universal traversal, it could be that we don't have enough examples at that point uh, to train a good classifier. So we realize most of the attempts that we have with finding the best rules through the classifier are failing. So in this case, we switch back to the local traversal. So, uh, and we do this by looking at, you know, the number of consecutive unsuccessful attempts that we have. So if we pass five rules, from either of these techniques to the annotator and they come back with a negative label, um, then we're gonna switch to the other essentially traversal algorithm. And that's how um, Darwin works at a high level. So um, let's talk about some of the ex uh, experiments that we have run. So essentially the first thing uh, we wanted to do is that um, comparing it to a SNUBA, which is another technique that can automatically give you rules, uh, you know, how well it performs. Um, so here you have to take into account that we are uh, comparing two systems that do not uh, align 100% in terms of their objective. So it's new what requires labeled data, uh, but Darwin doesn't. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Snuba doesn't need any inputs from the annotators uh, once the, 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 the label set is provided, but uh, Darwin still has to ask a few questions. So, um, here, what you see uh, is uh, that you are seeing the performance in terms of the percentage of positive instances discovered for two data sets. These data sets are called directions and musicians. So directions is essentially a running example. How can we find from a corpus of chat logs uh, that particular intent of uh, asking for transportation details? Um, and uh, this data set is about 10,000 instances. Um, and then the other data set is musicians, which is a, a, a random sample of um, uh, Wikipedia sentences. And we are, uh, we want to actually label any sentence that mentions name of a musician. So both of these things, you, you, you can imagine that you have the imbalance, a data imbalance problem. Um, and they are mostly, as I mentioned, in the order of uh, 10,000 uh, examples. So, uh, and what you see here is how many uh, seed instances we passed uh, to both techniques. So that's Darwin and Snuba. And what is the, the coverage that we have obtained uh, by both systems? And as you can see, you know, even with as few instances as 25 labeled instances, uh, Darwin actually can uh, discover most of the positive instances, while for the SNUBA, it often takes, uh, you know, um, requ it requires much more uh, labeled examples to be able to uh, achieve a similar performance. Um, all right, so uh, the next thing that we wanted to take a look at is that, uh, does it make sense for us actually to invest in these different traversal algorithms? You know, or are they actually needed and is switching back and forth between them is necessary? Uh, so here you see again uh, our results for two data sets. One is musicians, and then the other one is a new data set also from Wikipedia called cause and effect. Um, and uh, the cause and effect data set asks you to classify sentences that are uh, describing causality between two events or um, yeah, between two events or uh, that relationship between two entities. Um, and uh, again, as before, I'm showing the coverage, so the percentage of discovered rules uh, on the y-axis. But here on the x-axis, we have the number of questions that we have asked annotators. So the first thing that uh, I, I want to show here is that you can see that in, in both cases, in both data sets with 100 question, um, Darwin actually achieves a very good coverage. So essentially, instead of having to label many instances, you just have to verify about 100 goals. Um, and, uh, and what we can see here is that, you know, um, it is true that sometimes the, the universal traversal algorithms, which I'm showing here with uh, Darwin US and the local set traversal, which I'm uh, showing here with LS, sometimes perform better than the hybrid. But what we can see is that hybrid has a consistent performance that is, you know, always competitive or uh, slightly below one of these, uh, if it's not the best uh, traversal algorithm. So that's why actually in practice, we use the hybrid system because it can make the system, uh, you know, uh, not uh, get a stock uh, with respect to the problems that each of uh, these traversal algorithms can have. And then the other thing that you see here is a baseline called uh, high P, 
which essentially selects a rule that has the uh, that has the highest precision according to our classifier. So in this case, we're asking what if we just pick what we feel like is the best rule and the most precise rule at any point in time. Uh, so the, there is the counterpart to it, which is high recall. So what is the what is the rule that gives me uh, the, you know the maximum number of positive instances? But um, that that has a trivial solution, which is to return everything. So that's why uh, that baseline doesn't really make any sense. Um, all right, so. Uh, moving on, um, I just uh, want to uh, show this final experiment, which is not about the output of Darwin uh, and its coverage. It's about the classifier that we built using the output of these systems. Because uh, so far, I've just focused on coverage, you know, how many of the positive instances we are finding. But it is important to also get a sense of how many um, uh, noisy labels we have by, uh, by, by using these rules and whether they're going to uh, affect the outcome uh, of the, or the quality of the classifier we're going to train with these labels. So in this case, uh, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the F1 score uh, for the classifier that we have built for the task that we described earlier. And then you can again see the, the musicians and cause and effect data set. Uh, you have the, uh, the three versions of traversal algorithms for Darwin. You have the high precision uh, technique that we discussed before. And then we also have the, the active learning uh, baseline uh, denoted as AL here. So in this case, we actually go and uh, we uh, evaluate instances or uh, we show instances to the user of the, the data points that the model is least confident about. And then we also have KS, which is a, a sort of a baseline for picking rules randomly. Just to just to uh, get a sense of how well a random rule selection uh, based on performs, but you have to know that this is a still selecting from the the positive uh, the set of rules that have a good overlap with a positive set. So it's not a completely random uh, rule selection mechanism. And as you can see, um, I think uh, the F1 score for Darwin on both uh, data sets uh, is uh, you know above uh, 0.7, with even as little as 50 questions or 50 rules verified by the annotators. And if you extend that to 100, then you have a, a performance close to uh, 0.8 F1 score. Um, and uh, essentially, so the lessons we learned from this is that it makes sense to invest in, um, in an approach like this for building classifiers. So with that, I'd like to move to the conclusion. Um, so what I wanted to convey in this talk is that the process of writing labeling rules is still challenging. And this problem is uh, even more present when there is an imbalance in the underlying data. Um, and uh, Darwin simplifies the process of writing labeling rules by automatically suggesting uh, rules to the annotators and by kind of uh, relieving annotators from having to learn the rule language. And uh, as we can see, you know, with uh, as few as 50 questions, we can get very good performance on, um, on different tasks. So with that, I like to, uh, I want to thank you all for listening and giving me the opportunity to, to present this work. Thank you very much, Bezad, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes for question and answers. I just checked there's no question in the Q&A doc. So if anybody has questions, we can uh, just unmute yourself and, and we can have a discussion here. And if nobody has, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask one question again. Yeah. yeah, maybe in the meantime, I can just mention one more thing. So in general, whether, um, um, you want to use a system like Darwin or any of the other methods for weak supervision. Um, what we see over and over again, especially in the projects that we run in the lab, is that the, the process of labeling data is something that if you, you know, ask crowd workers to do, you wouldn't notice. But if you do it yourself, you realize that after labeling oftentimes 20 examples, you just want to say, oh, can I get these group of examples because they are all look like each other and uh, label all of them as positive and just kick them out of my workload. And, um, and that's how I actually got us to started to think about this problem because we, we are doing a lot of labeling ourselves and we see that 
you know, over and over again, that a lot of efforts that goes into labeling is unnecessary uh, for various reasons. And one thing that I keep thinking about is that in this case, you have to start with a particular rule language. You have to say, I'm using regular expressions or I'm using some constraints over parse trees. But I think that's even an overkill. So sometimes when you look at the instance, then you realize uh, that's all I want to express. And I keep thinking about this problem of how we can make that process um, easier. So still you can have a paradigm when people are labeling instances one by one, uh, but as soon as they see some overlapping patterns, they can just you know, highlight it. And then the system would automatically uh, find a rule for those. Um, so that would be sort of a hybrid of rule mining and sort of the manual labeling that we that uh, that is you know often used. So yeah, just just some um, uh, directions that I think are interesting, and we're also thinking about those in the lab. Uh, Bezad, I thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. Uh, a question about the hybrid uh, rule. Uh, mm -hmm. How often do you get to these unsuccessful five unsuccessful consecutive attempts, and you have to switch? And, and what is special about five? I mean, is it uh, just ex experience here, so that five is the right number? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, you are correct. So it, it is. It is actually very empirical. Uh, this five number five. But one thing I can I can share that maybe. Um, uh, helps with this uh, sort of choice is that, uh, so essentially uh, when we look at the system, at each point in time, it's either doing reasonably well with local search uh, or it's doing uh, uh, very well with the universal search. So essentially you don't have this uh, switch that happen too okay. often. So essentially in the beginning, for example, depending on what you start with, but you have, if you start with a few examples, then the local search definitely has a better performance and that stays for a while. And then you have the, uh, you have the universal search, uh, you know, kicking in later. Uh, but sometimes again, we see that the universal search um, doesn't really have, um, you know, it doesn't have added benefits because now it's getting at the point that it's maybe overfit to the set of current rules you have. So it's not really generalizing to anything new. And in this case, we go back to the local. And to be fair, I think at that point, it, it is kind of a blind search when you get back to the local uh, search, but um, still it's better to, to start with the set of keywords that you have available in the positive set and start trying them out to see uh, if they are going to give you something positive or not. Do you have uh, some intuition as to who, if you had to choose local versus universal, do you have some intuition as to uh, in what cases one would work better than the other? Yeah, so I would say uh, um, if you are starting with a very few examples um, and you also don't have a big budget of asking questions to annotators, then you should go with local. Um, if you have a bigger budget of questions, then it makes sense to start with local and switch to universal. Uh, but if, if that budget is big, you're gonna start from the universal because in the beginning, it essentially mimics doing random rule selection. So it's a little bit less efficient, but you can get away with using universal. And if you look at the, the plots that I've shown earlier, in the end, usually universal catches up because at that point you are in this self-training paradigm of, you know, what I have learned, what are the next best things that um, maybe I can look at and I start from there. Um, Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, I, I have uh, one question. Yes. So if, if I understood correctly, you said uh, you, you rate the quality of the candidate rules generated by Darwin based on the feedback from the annotators. So is there a, a, a way to even automate that, uh, maybe using additional label data? So I'm, I'm thinking of uh, in that label data versus uh, supervision required chart that would put Darwin maybe closer to Snuba. Uh, have you 
Talk yeah, about. I think that is a good point. And that's something that we haven't looked at, but you are absolutely right. So uh, if, if we have some labeled data, then it would be interesting to see if we can do some label propagation from those. Well, I mean, if we match an instance, maybe we have the label. So as you said, we don't even need annotators. Or even if it doesn't match that label set, maybe we can use some heuristic to say, okay, at least according to the label set, we have this mm -hmm. feeling about uh, this points being positive or negative. But yeah, we haven't looked at that, but that's, I think that's a, that's a good direction to pursue as well for, in, for cases where you have some labeled data. Okay, so uh, any last questions anyone had? Okay, then I think uh, let's all thank Bezad and I would uh, take the opportunity to uh, declare that we will end this workshop. Uh, I hope you all attend the remaining sessions in the symposium uh, tomorrow and, and so on. Thank, thank you, you all, all for attending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for listening.